Howdy friends, David Michael Phelps here. My guest today on Working Man is Dr. D.C. Schindler. Dr. Schindler is professor of metaphysics and anthropology at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family at the Catholic University of America. Now how's that for a title? Dr. Schindler has written many books and articles, and if I were to try to begin listing them here, we'd be here for a while. But he is renowned for, among other things, his work on Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, on postmodern thought, and more recently, on the philosophy of work. On today's episode, we discuss the philosophy of work, the dangers technology can pose to how we think about our work, Matthew Crawford's excellent book, Shop Class as Soulcraft, and the first steps to finding God in our day-to-day work. So, without further ado, here is my chat with Dr. D.C. Schindler. My name is uh, David Schindler. I go by D.C. Schindler in print to try to help uh, distinguish myself from my from my father, David L. Schindler, uh, who works also in, in philosophy and theology. Um, I teach at the John Paul II Institute, um, professor of metaphysics and, and, and philosophical anthropology. My work is mainly, uh, was originally in deep metaphysics, theology, uh, ancient Greek philosophy and that sort of thing. But over the years, it's gradually uh, drifted in a way to um, social and political sorts of of questions, although I try to approach these from that from that background, and uh, the I think the reason uh, you uh, propose having the conversation um, is uh, some work that I've been doing mm. on uh, on work, uh, philosophy of work, sort of philosophy and theology of work, and that's something that in a way just fell into my lap when I was invited to come teach at the John Paul II Institute. Through the discussions, it was proposed that I teach a class on the topic. I was initially a little taken aback and and uh, unsettled because it wasn't something I had given a lot of uh, of thought to originally. But it's funny; it's become, I think, my favorite class to teach. The the, the class on the philosophy of work. I I had no idea how how rich and interesting it could be, and so uh, that's something I've been working on quite a bit in these last few years. So, so tell me, what, what do you think, what is it about the, the philosophy of work that you have found so interesting? Well, you know, I think maybe one of the reasons I hadn't originally thought much about it is that it does seem like an everyday sort of thing, and, uh, and it's, you know, there's something, uh, at least there's something that can be tedious about it. There, actually, there's some philosophers that think that it's essentially tedious and uh so i i originally was not was was put off a bit but um but it's it's not hard to to say what what's so fascinating there's 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 something about the question of the nature of work and the meaning of work that brings together uh, a whole host of things that would otherwise seem unrelated in the question of 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 work you raise the question of uh, what is what is the the relationship between body and soul. So what what is my relationship to my body in doing work? You you, you raise a question of what you know um, the question of what is the relationship between uh, man and nature because we transform nature in work. The relationship between uh, human beings in general. The way work is organized is a is a statement about how we ought to relate to one another, the relationship between man and God, because God is the creator of the world. We, we, we work on the world and that, that makes a kind of judgment on, on, on God and, and the relationship, the meaning of, of, of the church that has a mission to, to transform the world. All of these philosoph- philosophical and theological questions converge in this really kind of concrete and uh, uh, existential way. And I think that's why, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's scarcely a theme that, that isn't implicated. So it's a huge topic. So it seems like a really narrow sort of side topic, but it's actually quite central and vast. The papal encyclicals loom large in this conversation and laborum excursions, the line, you know, the, the key to the social question, right? And that can that can sound like it's um, almost an offhand statement, but as you say, so many things converge on that aspect of the human experience. It's no question why that would be the case, right? No, you're exactly you're exactly right. No, that was that was a prophetic line. Uh, work is the key to the social question, and and there, I mean, because you know, when you when you work, 
you're you're not just um, uh, you're coming out of yourself into the world. You're engaging with something that is other than yourself, and in a way, you're doing it also for other people. And so, so work is 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 a is a kind of privileged place where you uh, where society comes together, where society sort of takes shape. You know, it's easy to instrumentalize work to just think of it as something that needs to be done in order to achieve other ends. But 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 in fact, the way we think about work, the way we organize it, the way we uh, do it, uh, the role that it has in our lives, the role that it has in our families. That actually is a is a kind of a basic statement about the meaning of life, and so so I mean I think John Paul II was absolutely correct by by saying it's the key to the social question. It really, it really is. One of the things I really appreciated in the article you'd written out in Humanum was making this 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 distinction between the, the fruit of the work, right, being utility or a, a means of supporting yourself, right, as opposed to you know the nature and goal of work. Seeing seeing work as a place and a path to seek God, right? This is this is your thesis in that article. Why do you suppose that seems like such an alien idea today? Yeah, great question. And you see how, I mean, you know, to answer it, we actually would have to go through the whole, you know, church history, political history. I mean, you you, you see, I mean, everything is implied in these questions. But I mean, to try to give a kind of a succinct a brief, a brief answer is um yeah how to how to how to approach this here's one way that the the um the create the natural world is created by god and it's a gift of god and when god created the world he actually gave himself in giving the world being that was a kind of a self gift and and god remains present in the natural world in some in some inchoate way inchoate but still accessible and there's a there's a sense in which in very traditional forms of work uh carpentry you know building with stone uh where one has a has a hands-on direct relationship to the natural world there's a way in which you're you're even unconsciously you're just enjoying the presence of god i mean all of us know that thrill that you get when you put your hand on a freshly sanded piece of wood and you smell it i mean there's there's a kind of a joy that we feel in that and and that joy really is the that i mean that there's something of the presence of god in that you know one of the things that's happened in um and we can go into the history behind all this but one of the things that happened in the in the growth of the modern world is we increasingly sort of, we lost sight of that kind of intimate connection with God. And we increasingly started to think of of work in purely uh, instrumentalist utilitarian terms. So the the only point of work is to produce something that you can sell. And when that's your relationship, um, in, in a way you have no encounter with reality and what you're doing, you're just trying to get it done as fast and as efficiently as possible to, to sell it. Um, now, I don't want to uh, criticize, you know, pass judgment that there, there are all sorts of good reasons to do that. And, and uh, people work to support families and so forth. That not everyone can enjoy the work that they do. But, but um, if you think about uh, when we, you know, society as a whole, if, we're, if we've organized society around work in this more sort of traditional sense versus organized society in this more you know, technological uh, sense, it's going to change our experience of of work. One of the things that um, that I'm particularly interested in is, is the following scenario. The last mm, 20, 30 years or so, I think it's it's not difficult to find people approach this question, this aspect of the social question, or we may call it the economic question, right? Uh, right. And they tend to speak in terms of I, I, they, they tend to be a little, I don't know, abstract. And I have nothing against, obviously, um, talking about, say, the importance of business or entrepreneurship or these sorts right. of things, right? But um, I always found, I always felt this real lack of someone who comes, for lack of a better term, from a blue-collar family or from the trades. Right. I never quite right. felt it was speaking to account for that experience. And as a result, yeah. I think you have all these uh, people who work in particular fields who, in a sense, are a step closer to that more incarnate interaction with work and the world through their work. 
but who aren't really um I, I don't want to say they're not being taught or formed, but they're, they're not being taught or formed in something that they might yeah. be especially well suited to understand and therefore share with right. others. I don't want to say how you account for that, but how, how do you begin to correct for that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think that's one of the things your school uh, is doing that's that's interesting. I I um, um I think one of the uh, uh, one of the important things is um to and i don't know if I, if this gets at your particular point so you can correct me but um one of the things is to restore a sense of the dignity of blue collar work um you know i think the the automizing or automatizing of 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 so much of that um has threatens the dignity in some sense you know when we when we can get computers to do the work for us then you know, if if we end up doing the work, we're doing a work that computers can do. You know what I mean? It's it's it no longer has a kind of human reality to it. And and um, we, you know, we do it to try to make things better for human beings because we're trying to lessen the the burden of of work. But the danger is that in lessening the burden of it, we're actually depriving it of its of its dignity. And uh, sometimes the things that are um, worth doing you know even if they are difficult and uh, uh and burdensome i mean precisely because then it you know it's something that takes as you as you say you know um you talk about growing up in a blue collar family there's so many of these things that that you you can only uh understand properly if you've really been around for a long time and you've had a kind of a regular um uh interaction um and and you know, hands-on sort of contact. So uh, by restoring the dignity of work and recognizing it as representing kind of a human ideal that we want our kids to be involved in and we want to be involved in more ourselves um, uh, rather than participating in this sort of flight from flight from work that characterizes so much of our civilization. I don't know if you know the book, um, uh, Matthew Crawford's book. Um, oh yeah. Shop class is soul craft. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that book um, uh, made a really huge impression on me when I, when I read it a few years ago. Uh, I've, I've read it two or three times and being able to have someone who, who speaks with a particular type of authority where he says, you know, I live this certain, you know, the academic life, for lack of a better term, and he'd always seen this or perceived that there's supposed to be this dichotomy between what he was doing, say, as an academic or a philosopher and what he was doing with a motorcycle and realizing, oh, no, 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 it's, it's really the same thing. But over here, I'm doing it with my hands as well as my head. And somehow I can, I can connect with that contemplation more fully by having that sort of uh, dual experience as opposed to the, the singular. Yeah. I, yeah. That's an amazing. Point. Right. I mean, as a matter of fact, I mean, he said, he said working on motorcycles, he found more intellectually satisfying than mm. his uh, think tank work. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I think is, is, uh, is very interesting. Um, and it has, yeah, it's the body soul unity there. It, it is. And, you know, it, one of the things, um, one of the things that occurred to me in reading that was, the farther we get away from um, sort of an embodied experience with our work through technological means. And that isn't to say that, I mean, you know, a hammer is a technology, right? I mean, but, That's right. That's um, right. but it seems to me that the, the question of how technology opens up a distance, like how mm -hmm. far you are separated, like you increase your power, but you're also right. sort of continually distancing yourself. And, and as I think about even Crawford, it throws you back towards Socrates, like, well, you better watch out for this written language technology because it's going to distance you, right, <laughs> from, yeah. you know, from the actual yeah. sort of concrete wisdom. It's certainly the case these days that we know that that distancing problem of, the, of technology, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, no, and that's, and that you put your finger right on it. I mean, the, the, the issue with technology is just, you know, does the technology enhance your connection to the thing or is it the, 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 it becomes dangerous when it substitutes for your personal presence, you know, you know, the distancing, that you, you know, it sort of takes you out of the picture, you know, whereas, uh, I mean, that's one of the points that Crawford makes in the book, you know, uh, uh, plumbing is not something you can have a, a computer. It's not, you don't do it on the assembly line. You can't ship it off to 
farm the work to China, you can't, um, you, you know, you can't just have a manual do it. You, you actually, there's no replacement for the guy who actually uh, has his hands on the thing and sees what's going on and has done it so many times, has developed a fine attentiveness and capacity to make judgments that um, computers can't make, artificial intelligence is incapable of, and and certainly no no manual. I mean, we're you know, not even YouTube videos will help you figure out some of those things. That's right. Maybe there's an essay you can write one day called "Plumbing as Presence." Um, <laughs> because that's right. I mean, it's it's you know, much is made in the skilled trades about you know, there are certain uh, certain skill sets that that probably can never be replaced because there's a there's a particularity, be it of this mm-hmm. particular pipe in this particular place in this particular circuit. I mean, there's there's all these particularities that require something like the presence of a human consciousness embodied to fully account for. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, and you and you realize in some, you know, the the electrical work in in this house here is very complicated and um we the guy that we have do the work i mean he he goes back generations he knows the history of the the development here i mean he he and it's amazing he's able to figure out he understands how the how why things are wired the way they are and 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 will be connected to certain stories about when they were you know developing and it um we once had a problem uh and and this guy was unavailable so we we got on recommendation at top of the line you know, very intelligent uh, electrician who came in and couldn't make heads or tails of the place. And and he gave up and was kind of angry. And I just realized, you know, um, you, there's, there's, there's no substitute for mm. experience and kind of historical knowledge mm. with, with some things, you know, mm. cause this is not a standard, the wiring is not standard here, you know, and our plumbing is not, nothing in this house apparently is standard. <laughs> And there's never going to be another house like it, and it's a, it's of that yeah. place and of that time. So let me ask yeah. you this: What um, if you were to to give advice? If you were to give advice to a young man, he says, "Okay, I understand, uh, Doctor Schindler, that you say that uh, God can be found in my work." Step one to that is what, like practically, what, like where is he? Point him out. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a great question. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that step one is is. Um, uh, God is present to us most immediately in goodness, beauty, and truth. And that means that, concretely speaking, our most immediate relationship to God comes through the things we most love. And so I would say to someone, rather than at starting with this abstract question, how do I find God? You start out with the basic question, what do I want to do? <laughs> what attracts and and what is it that attracts me and you know um i think all of us have this experience um there are different ways you can ask the question what do i want to do you can ask the question in kind of a lazy reactive sort of emotional what do i feel like doing right now kind of way a sort of immediate reaction and then there's the deep form of the question where we ask you know, what is it that really attracts me and really satisfies me what kind of thing and that's that's step one and when you find that you pursue it and you devote yourself to it and you commit yourself and you deepen your relationship and you deepen your knowledge and that is the encounter with god Mm -hmm. um uh it would not be profoundly satisfying to humanity to your humanity if God were not present in it. So, you know, contrast that with um, say, well, you know what? I love doing X, but I think there's no market for it. And Y is something I'm pretty good at. And um, I know I could make a ton of money doing. And I, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to make money. I have nothing against that. But it seems to me that typically the person who who pursues a thing that they're maybe not so interested in, but they like it enough that they can see themselves doing it for a long time, but are princip- but are choosing it not for that reason, but they're choosing it because of the money that they stand to make. There, there's it's not going to be satisfying. There's not going to be a, a deep sense of you're 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 going to use it 
use your work as a means to try to get money to find human satisfaction somewhere else. And that's there you are not finding God in your work. You're, 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 it's the exact opposite. So, I mean, in a way, it's, it is a very concrete and existential sort of question you know, what, what do I love? To go back to the Matthew Crawford book, you know, he told a little anecdote about going to India and um, he was on a kind of a spiritual quest, but arrived there. Uh, he was a young man and was feeling totally alienated. And, and suddenly he saw some electricians uh, laying some wire and he real and that, that was something that he had done as a summer work for for a time and he suddenly felt the connection with these people and felt a kind of um joy and started immediately wondering well what what size wire they're using how are they what's their technique and you know all these questions immediately and and you know those are the kinds of questions that a lover asks i mean I, that sounds sort of romantic but i mean that in just a, a very normal sense you know, if if you're if you love something, if you love cars, you immediately want to know the little details about it. If you love, you know, and and there that, that experience, he he thinks he's going on this religious quest to find God and feels alienated. And what is the thing that sort of sa- saves him? And and you know, eventually it took him years, but eventually that's the work he ended up doing. You know, that's he he, he sort of finally responded to his real desire. I don't know if he would put it in these terms, but I would. You know, he found he found God. Um, we live in a place where, you know, it, it's it's a good life living in the West in the 21st century, mm-hmm. all things mm-hmm. considered. Um, obviously, we maybe have, not the last couple uh, months. Yeah, but, last you know. couple of months. Been, <laughs> yes, there's been a, a waiter. There's a fly in my suit. Take this away from me, right? Um, but. Uh, but all things considered, I mean, uh, we, we, we have it pretty good. And so we, ha- we, 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 we live in an age in a place of plenty, relatively speaking. And, um, and, and yet, I think more people are accustomed to seeing their work as what you said you wouldn't want it to be. It's just, it's just a means to, it's a means to the weekend. And that's where I can, that's where yeah. I can do what I love. Be myself. That's, that's where I can be yeah. myself, right? I mean, if, if that's the norm, that's quite a, that's quite a hill to conquer, to, to reverse that. Um, do you have any thoughts about what reversing it looks like? <laughs> other than, other than taking up philosophy of work? Well, and- you know, I mean, I, I, I am kind of amazed at, uh, uh, you know, as, as troubling as so many cultural developments are, there are hopeful ones. And, you know, it, it's, it's, um, you know, I've had uh, two students become farmers, for instance, um, you know, that had no, didn't grow up on a farm. I mean, this is just, they, they decided to do it and they're both doing, uh, very well. Uh, I mean, and love it, love what they do. You know, that's something that never would have been on the horizon when I was a student. I, I, I can't imagine, but you know, how, how many people are, are getting into, um, cooking in, in a, in a serious way or gardening or there, there it, se- it seems like there, there are these movements, you know, local, uh, uh, an attentiveness to local work and the organic. And, and I, I take all of that to be um, uh, a, a sign of hope. You know, the, the, the odd thing is, is that these developments uh, uh, are, are, are going on parallel with the exact opposite, you know, this increasingly abstract and surreal kind of cyber life that we are are living more and more and maybe 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 part of the attraction to the organic and the real and the and the concrete and the natural is is a cry of desperation because we're moving as a culture so quickly in this other direction who knows but but um you know you've you've um um there's there's an amazing you here's you look at architecture or or city planning you know there there was a period in american history where things just went off the rails and the kinds of building that was done was ugly and inhuman and purely utilitarian and then, or, or totally abstractly aesthetic. And I mean, if you look at the kinds of uh, things that people are interested in, in architecture now, it's, it's infinitely better. I mean, go to any campus that's been around for a while and you can see the original buildings were beautiful 
Then there's about 50 years of buildings that are just, I mean, an, an embarrassment. And then the buildings built in the last 10 or 15 years, 20 years, they're actually starting to be beautiful again. I mean, we're coming back to our senses. You know, it occurs, your answer occurs to me that my, my, my question was, was terribly deterministic. And fatalistic, wasn't it? I mean, because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's it'll come back around, and there's the end. Even um, even if you don't have a reason to believe, we we should always have reason to hope. And yeah, I think that's yeah, right. Yeah. I think that there's something um, there's something about the human spirit that rebels against brutalism. And if you get yeah, fifty years yeah. of brutalism, it it, it just can't. Yeah. It'll it'll end up crumbling under its own ugliness. Yeah, and and um, you know, to to the Matthew Crawford's book always makes me think of Robert Persig's book. I don't mm. know if you yes, know yes. uh, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which you know is funny, but that that was one of the most important books I ever. Read. That book changed my life. It's why I do what I do. Way way back in high school when I first read it, you know, there there's something dated about some of the, the 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 thinking in the book of course but uh but it's still the the central insights i think are 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 timeless really in the, in the good sense and he raises this question how do we change society uh you know he cites some sort of zen master saying that if you want to um paint a beautiful picture become a beautiful person and paint naturally uh Something like that. And then he says, you know, when I face this question, how do I change society? He said, you know, what I need to do is fix this motorcycle in front of me in a, in a, in a good way. Be attentive to this particular work that's right in front of me. And, and, and that kind of peace and order and harmony and beauty and, and fidelity and that that has a tendency to kind of radiate outwards, you know, into family and friends. And, and so, I, I mean, I think that's, so that's another way to answer the question is, is the, the only way to make a change is to, is to figure out what you, what each of our work is and try to do it with integrity and love and, and let the rest kind of happen naturally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read an article recently by an Orthodox priest. I can't recall his name at the moment addressing the, the the news of the last month and um he 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 did it with a great deal of nuance and compassion i thought but the the line that stuck out to me was um you know no amount of voting is going to solve problems if if the heart is remains corrupted yeah it's not going to be a it's not going to be a political program or a policy or or right. you know yeah yeah any any more it. than the kingdom of god is i suppose right i mean that's right. Um, well, um, I have one one other question. It's in approaching the philosophy of work. What is the question uh, a beginner ought to be asking? I think the very first question is uh, to find a role model. You know, I think the 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 image of uh, of a kind of apprenticeship that that's an I think with any real human activity, you learn it by seeing someone who does it well do it, and you. You you admire that person and what they do, and you try to imitate it. Um, and uh, you know, if possible, have a sort of mentorship. You know, so so you know, in the kind of thing that you want to do, you think about someone who, who does it in a way that strikes you as onto something. As you know, they figured out the, a certain secret about it. they 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 understand it and and follow that person. That's what I would say. As always, everyone, thanks for listening to Working Man. Now, there's a couple things I want to say here before we wrap up. Number one, you'll notice that lately we've been posting these episodes bi-weekly instead of weekly like normal. That's largely due to the fact that we're racing towards this fall when we will host the very first class of students at Harmel Academy of the Trade. So as you can imagine, things are very busy around here these days. But you can help us out. As we prepare to welcome this first batch of students, we're also looking now for people willing to support those students by becoming a donor and supporter of Harmel Academy. It's quick, it's easy, you can do it right on our website, harmelacademy.org. You know, like any school, tuition only covers a percentage of the cost of education, and every gift helps us. Your support allows us to form the next generation of Catholic tradesmen, men of skill, character, and faith. I can't wait for you to meet these guys. So anything you can do to help us do that, 
any amount of money you can pitch into the bucket would be very much appreciated. And you can donate at harmelacademy.org. Number two, as you remember, our last guest on Working Man was Dr. Jordan Baller. And Dr. Baller has very generously donated copies of two of his books for a podcast giveaway. The first one is his book, Makers of Modern Christian Social Thought, Leo XIII and Abraham Kuyper on the Social Question. And the second book is Get Your Hands Dirty, Essays on Christian Social Thought and Action. Now, Dr. Baller has offered to inscribe these books and send them to 10 lucky listeners for free. These are free books. So here's how you can win one. Step one, hop over to Apple Podcasts and give Working Man a review. Be honest with us. If you hate it, give us a half a star. That's not going to affect your chances. If you love it, then give us all the stars, but that won't affect your chances of winning either. Step two, sign up for our newsletter at harmelacademy.org. When you sign up, be sure to let us know what your Apple review handle is and what your home address is so we can mail you the book. If you're already signed up for the newsletter, you can just use the contact form, let us know that you've left us a review, and you'll be eligible to win. So the first 10 folks to complete these two steps will win one of these two books. Thank you very much, Dr. Ballard. Once again, thank you everyone for listening to Working Man. We're very excited about our first class of students coming up here at Harmel Academy of the Trade. So if you haven't told your friends, your family, your priest, your rich uncle about what we're doing, then please spread the word. Thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you next time.